across your head Tired of getting walked on, treated like a sheep Don't blame me for all the years that you were asleep Relax, God is in control The story you're about to hear is true Truth, 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 truth Is it true? Facebook, uh, but it's not exclusively on Facebook. You can listen to this on Mega, on the BitTorrents, on uh, sometimes on Buzzsprout. That gets syndicated elsewhere. And the there are, oh yeah, Mega and YouTube, of course. So it's kind of all over the place. I try to spread it to any media where I can post it or paste it. Uh, and if you know of any media that I could have access to, definitely get in touch. I'm always interested in feedback, or if you know of any Creative Commons songs that you would like played on this show, give me a, a ring at Ricochet, call it M for Mountain S, Z, I, S, N for Neptune, A, F for Foxtrot, 7, V for Victor, QQ, P for Penguin, H for Hotel, R for Romeo, V for Delta. Ricochet is a free software alternative to Facebook Messenger and Signal and other centralized or at least potentially compromised instant messaging systems. Uh, Ricochet, it is getting a little bit old, but it is it does provide at least uh, in hope uh, of some privacy if it isn't broken, which of course, read the source code, figure out if it's broken yourself. So what is going on this week in my world? The first thing is that my bike is broken. And so normally I get around the city, even during the winter, the cold winter, this has been a very cold week by bicycle. Unfortunately, somehow between the cold affecting the metal and the amount of weight I was putting on it, and maybe the amount of weight I've been putting on, <laughs> I have broken my bicycle. So the bike is in the shop today. It is slowing me down so much. You may notice this show, this particular broadcast is a little bit later than usual. That is why, because I am just trying to get everything that I would normally get done. And it is taking so, so much longer with having to walk everywhere. But that is not the only thing going on in the world. And in my world in particular, I have two questions that kind of came out of the peanut gallery of the Fediverse. By the way, the Fediverse is an alternative to Twitter that is not owned by a single corporation. It is a collection of free software servers that either you can run yourself to run the whole network or at least your part of the network and then be a user of your server, or you can just be a user of someone else's server. There is a cultural norm of allowing people for free uh, to just show up and use other people's servers for this purpose. But the downside of that is then you are basically joining someone's community and each community has their own cultural norms and practices and codes of ethics and you name it. So depending which community you join, if you join a really far left communist community and you start talking favorably about capitalism, for example, you might find yourself in a difficult position uh, and being asked to leave. Or alternatively, if you join a really radically uh, pro-capitalist group and start calling for the dictatorship of the proletariat or something like that, uh, again, don't be surprised if people start showing you the door. There's politics involved in that, but at least it's an alternative to Twitter uh, so that you can kind of choose where in the network you belong specifically. So anyway, one of the people on the Fediverse is a guy by the name of Augustus Hugin, if I'm pronouncing that right. 
and he asks a question, quote, Britain captured this island, i.e. the island of Perim, in the 19th century and built a lighthouse on it. It's the mouth where the Red Sea opens into the Indian Ocean. Are there any examples of U.S. imperialism leading to them building cool shit that lasts? So this is kind of an open question to the world. I don't know the answer to this question. I'm hoping somebody who is listening right now is aware of something that the U.S. government or the U.S. military, in their basically putting military bases around the world and conquering all kinds of little islands and spreading their, their government and culture and rules and extradition and treaties and you name it all over the world, surely they must have built something by now that we can point to and say, oh yeah, that was that was actually a cool thing. And kind of like the Romans, I think it's in the Monty Python Life of Brian where they're complaining about the Romans and saying, yeah, the Romans, what are they good for anyway? You know, they've done nothing good, well, except the roads. Yeah, I guess there was the roads and oh yeah, the aqueducts. They, they brought the aqueducts. And modern medicine, yeah, modern medicine, right? I mean, like even the United States, for all the bad in the world that it's done, has actually done a lot of good too. And they brought things like technology to, to places and place, things like clean water, whatever. But we should be able to point to something specific, right? Like some, some mint or, or some set of bridges or I, I don't know what it is. But if you know somewhere in the world where the U.S. government specifically has kind of built something along these lines, uh, definitely either post it in one of these threads where this video is posted or send me a line uh, again. And uh, we'll hopefully get a, an answer to that, because I think it's kind of been a good question, a question that I'd like to know the answer to. But more importantly, I'd like us to be kind of talking about it. This isn't the sort of thing. There, there are questions like this, I think, where like, you can Google that. You can find out the answer yourself very quickly if, it, if someone else has already done the hard work of thinking. But we should be talking about the U.S. government and their involvement around the world. And there... I don't I don't want to go too again too deep into the US government and their involvement in places like Okinawa, which I learned about this week. Very interesting topic. But it's it is worth talking about. And there's a lot of people who just don't know, who have no idea how thoroughly conquered the world is right now, or at least how widespread the American influence is. So when you get stuff like, for example, the government of Iran freaking out when the US uh, kills one of their senior uh, leaders, a lot of people, for example, don't know how encircled by American military bases Iran is. And so that, that's kind of sometimes interesting to point out. Uh, the other question came from one uh, Tim Pasteur on Twitter, the bird site, quote, is there any serious criminal out there still physically robbing banks? And if so, is it just for kicks or is it lacking the computer skills for it? Uh, purely anecdotal, but I can't remember the last time I heard of one. And likewise, I it's been a while since I've heard of an actual bank robbery happening, but surely they must still be happening somewhere in the world. Like I've, I've heard of ATMs being hacked and people stealing ATMs. Like even in Thunder Bay, there was a year, was it a year or two ago? A couple of guys in a pickup truck just like showed up to, what is it, High Variety on High Street? And the, oh, there we go. We So we got bank robbery in Regina weeks ago. Way to go, Regina. <laughs> Way to go. Awesome. That, that's good to know. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll dig that one up if, if I can kind of find it. But it does seem like there's more possibilities for bank robbery going through the computer side. The ATM network, or at least the there is a back-end network that, is, at least as I understand it, is still run on not even the internet, but uh, the telephone network's SS7 layer. So it's one of those things where like the, the back-end for some of these banks is so ancient. Uh, it's probably all still written in COBOL. It's probably all still written in EBCDIC instead of ASCII. And the idea of security is just hope that nobody has access to the system, which is, of course, not an assumption that you can reasonably make with SS7. And so there's just gaping holes in some of the, the bank's security that people have been exploiting to the tune of billions, if not by now trillions of dollars. And so that's going on. At the same time, I guess, people are still going to the banks and trying to get the cash out of them. But stealing bread or stealing the spare change from like a vending machine or something like that, right? It's it, There's so much more money to be made by actually robbing the bank rather than robbing the tellers at the bank. That if you're into that sort of thing and you're willing to break the law and you're willing to steal and all that sort of thing, the bang for your buck on it is way higher. So Something to think about anyway. So there's that going on. And Sassboy has a link here. Regina Police Charge Man, 54 in downtown bank robbery. Thanks, Sassboy. That's very handy. And so those were the two open questions that I wanted to, to put out to the world now that we've got an answer for one of them. This 
the first thing that I wanted to kind of talk about is there was a bunch of articles going around the internet about four weeks ago, or at least it was about four weeks ago that I saw them. And they said something along the lines of Facebook removes 600 fake accounts or 600 news accounts or, or pro-Trump uh, propaganda accounts or something along those lines, right? They're just like talking about the removal of these trolls or these fake news outlets. And I mean, there's a lot of fake news outlets and there's a lot of things that you could kind of go to and think, okay, well, there's good reasons why we, we can see these things being removed and there's no rede redeeming value whatsoever. And that is kind of what I thought was going on with this particular story until I s noticed who exactly it was talking about. And so I'm, I'm going to blank out the who while I read the kind of two example news articles on this. One is from August. Actually, they're both from August, so it's a little bit more than four weeks ago. But anyway, quote, Facebook has banned advertising from blank, the, and this is a, a clue here, uh, the Falun Gong related publication and conservative news outlet is the social network struggles to implement a, a consistent political advertising policy. Facebook issued the ban on Friday after NBC News published a report this week that said blank had obscured its connection to recent Facebook ads promoting President Trump and conspiracy content. And uh, the blank started in 2000 by a group of Chinese Americans affiliated with the religious group Falun Gong has in recent years ridden the wave of conservative pro-Trump social media popularity to build a large social media following. On a website, it advances conspiracy content such as anti-vax theories, while its YouTube channels promote pro-Trump fringe movement, QAnon, and other topics. And... The Blank's official Facebook accounts were banned by the social network in July, but according to NBC report, it then read new Facebook ads without disclosing they were associated with the outlet. The ads ran under page names such as Honest Paper and Pure American Journalism and purchased by Market Fuel subscription services and Perpetual Market, which are decoy names for Blank, according to NBC News. And then they kind of go into the, the particular rules they broke and how that this was basically just this blank newspaper or news source uh, sidestepping rules that they knowingly knew that they were being violating. Quote, the tactic mirrors that used by Russia's internet research agencies to launder, holy cow, to launder disinformation across social movements by creating imposter pages, according to Joan Donovan, director of technology and social research at Pro or project at Harvard University Shorenstein Center. The weaponizing of advertising is crucial for growing the audiences for this disinformation. Okay, so that was the first one. I'm going to talk like point by point through some of that in a bit, but I, I just want to give two perspectives on this in case you think this is just like the New York Times' vendetta or something like that. This is from Yahoo. A quote, Facebook has banned new ad buys from pro-Trump conservative outlook blank, citing violations of ad policies. Earlier this week, the NBC report found blank, an outlet affiliated with this Chinese spiritual community. Notice they, they switched from religious to spiritual. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Falun Gong uh, shifted its spending on Facebook in the last month, seemingly in an effort to obfuscate its, connected, its connection to some 2 million worth of ads that promoted the president and conspiracy theories about his political enemies after NBC News contacted Facebook, the social media site. Acted. Okay, so we've got a, a link here. YouTube making networks of disinformation using the recommended video algorithm. That's an interesting looking link. We might dig into that in a bit. And so anyway, quote, Facebook ads are tricky politically. Just last month, the president's own re-election campaign was busted for seem seemingly using free stock video footage to portray his real life supporters. These MAGA, quote, fans in the stock footage aren't even allowed to vote for President Trump if they wanted to with models coming out of not only Turkey, but Brazil and France as well. Da, da, da. Interesting, this page, this Yahoo page actually has ads. No, they're not ads. They're just stories that have really saucy, really, really saucy pictures. They look like ads though. Kind of, it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to tell the difference between ads and political uh, commentary, right? This page here, is it an ad? Is it a political con commentary filled with links to ads that are look almost identical? That's kind of interesting on, on its own. And another thing I saw this week was AOC, one of the, I think she's a member of the House of Representatives in the States right now. Couldn't tell you where, but uh, she was grilling Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook to ask him if she would be allowed in her campaign uh, to promote face or fake news as advertisements uh, in the Re Republican primary race uh, to basically target black voters 
and tell those black Republican voters that the person that they're supporting in the Republican primaries supported this environmentalist proposal that obviously none of them did, but specifically just to like mess with people's minds, right? And understanding of the world. And so the the bigger question is like, as soon as Facebook starts banning some ads, but not others, people like that are going to start pushing that line a little bit further and saying, okay, well, here's a, this situation, right? Promoting Republicans as supporting some climate change proposal, which obviously none of them will. Will that be prohibited, right? Because if that's allowed, then that line will move a little bit further, right? And if it's prohibited, then again, the line of what is allowed and not can kind of be moved around in a politically meaningful way. But what's interesting about these past two stories, though, is the outlet in question, the Epoch Times, is actually a real newspaper. It is a newspaper that has been publishing for decades, and it is a newspaper that has their own political slant. They, they have their own biases, like any other newspaper. Uh, and yet, in this particular case, they're being covered as if they're just some kind of propaganda outlet for conservatives, even though whether or not they're, they're pro-conservative or not, over the long haul, seems to be mostly a function of whether or not conservatives align against the government of China in support of, or, or in support of the Falun Gong, which is a religious movement in China that's getting a particularly rough time in their trying to survive as a, a movement under a effective dictatorship uh, that outlaws them and throws them in concentration camps and tortures them. So you can see that they're a little bit touchy on the subject of China, but Donald Trump has been pushing back against China. So that has made them kind of fellow travelers politically. And so when the New York Times, or when and NBC, or when Yahoo Entertainment, weird that this is covered under entertainment news, but whatever, when any of these say that they're like pushing conspiracy content, one of the things that newspapers do is they investigate claims of conspiracy, and they investigate claims of what the government is doing, or members of the, the political opposition, their political opposition, the, the people who they support, whatever, right? It's when we live in a world where it's not sure who's cooperating with who and who's conspiring behind the scenes with who and who's corrupt, which levels of government and how, uh, one of the ways we can sort these things out is by having real journalists uh, do research and publish their findings in physical newspapers. Uh, the point here is that, yes, the Epoch Times does promote some things that maybe we may disagree with. And as Falun Gong, I, I'm not part of the Falun Gong. I don't support the Falun Gong. I think that some of the things they've been experiencing at the hand of the Chinese government is unfortunate, to say the least, and is totally against their basic human rights. But at the same time, I don't think that they should be banned for being against the Chinese government and saying things or making accusations that they can at least try to back up in print in a free forum with an open editorial section, just like any other newspaper. This is a an alternative to the New York Times in the best way, right? It is a, or at least was at the time that this happened, a real published newspaper. Now, since this occurred, I don't know if it just hurt their business so much or if they've uh, been part of the larger trend in North America that people are moving away from reading newsprint and reading, getting their information from newspapers. So they have been trying to transition to an online presence and doing things like starting these groups like Honest Paper and Pure American Journalism. And they're trying to follow the path of things like BuzzFeed that lower their journalistic standards just that little bit and increase the amount of clickbait and increase the amount uh, of uh, attention grabbing activity just so that you can draw their readers in and get them perhaps to read the serious things that they have to say about the way the Chinese government treats the Falun Gong. Now, maybe this does break the rules of Facebook a little. That, that's entirely possible. But at the same time, if you take a step back and take a look at the situation of what's happening, it's a newspaper effectively being cut out from accessing the public by Facebook. Facebook is a competitor to news services like newspapers. It is a competitor. The newspapers know it. They all see the graphs of 
the amount of time people are spending reading newspapers over time, and the amount of time that people are reading Facebook over time, and how they are virtually inversely related. And so the newspapers know that they have to be on this task and getting their audience to continue to read them in some way, shape, or form. And so as far as the Epoch Times is concerned, perhaps their quality is going downhill. Perhaps they've have taken too much of those little red pills and are now hopelessly lost in conservative land. That's all possible, but there's still a newspaper. They're still hiring journalists. They're still doing research. They're still having something to, to say about the world. And again, Facebook has just cut them from us accessing them. And, and then on top of that, from them even just using the, the ad system to reach people as kind of an alternative to just publishing, never mind a newspaper, but a page on Facebook. So I got some more comments from the peanut gallery. The recommendation algorithm, uh, this must be on YouTube, uh, created a network for child exploitation by classifying videos with kids in them, sending abusers to other channels, videos with kids in them. When alerted to the problem, YouTube acted to stop the recommendations. And uh, true, they did, um, but they've also limited the amount that children can then uh, follow up on classifying videos with other children and work together as a group. I mean, adults do have kind of a, a little bit of an advantage there uh, who might be willing to take advantage of them, but it, there's benefits and costs to what YouTube did. My channel, as a reminder from previous shows, has been caught up in this, and my YouTube channel no longer has comments on its videos because these videos are affected by that rule change. And so suddenly people can't discuss the things that I say. They can't find the errors that I make unless they're on Facebook. And right now Facebook is letting us have comments on videos like this. But given that Twitter and YouTube have both gone this way, how long until Facebook goes the same way? As far as how saucy the pictures in the news article or on uh, Yahoo were, I don't know. There's some bikini clad uh, skinny women and they look like they're at some kind of pool party or something like that. They're, they're pretty skimpy. Nothing like lots of flesh showing, but nothing not work safe, but definitely straddling that line a little bit. The, oh yeah, AOC is from Queens in the Bronx in New York. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Right. Cause I, I remember reading something about the, there's like a scene in some new Batman movie with the, the Joker walking down some really famous set of stairs. And that's like in her, her hood. Uh, so that, that makes sense political advertising banned by Twitter. Okay, it reminds me that Facebook censored Saskaboy blog. That's right. And so we keep getting closer and closer to this situation where Facebook has more and more control over what we see and hear. And especially when news sources start getting axed, right? That's when things start getting dangerous. And so I don't know if I would personally sign up for the paid Epoch Times newsletter or suggest anyone do that. I think that is what they're doing as an alternative to print media. It used to be the case that you would just be able to pick these up for free. Uh, it was ad supported, but it was paper ads. So they weren't intrusive uh, spying on you ads that you get online. Uh, they were just like you, you go to the, the bus stop or something like that. And there was a paper stand and you read the paper. And oh, and the, in addition to ads, it was probably paid for by the Falun Gong itself because it is a way for the Falun Gong to get their message out. Oh, similar to, I don't know where I put it, but I've subscribed to this. Uh, I'm missing both my newspaper and this thing, but I subscribed to this newsletter that's put out by this Baptist church in Philadelphia. And again, it's free. It's a free source of news. Why is it free? Because they have their own bias and they feel that they're not able to get their message out unless people have access to it for free. Just like I feel that when I broadcast this message, this show, I'm not going to charge for it because nobody's going to pay for it. You're at best going to listen to it if it's free, right? So there's this incentive for, for certain groups and people to want to publish and to want to get their message out. And that is what was used to be paying for the Epoch Times, at least in part, in addition to the ads. Whereas now they've switched to a model where you have to basically pay them and subscribe. I don't know what their numbers are, are like right now, uh, but I can't imagine their, their readership is anywhere close to what it used to be. And that's what lets groups like the New York Times and Yahoo or Entertainment to get away with calling them just another propaganda mill or just another troll farm or whatever, right? It's their, their readership shrank so much that they're so far and few between on the ground that you don't necessarily encounter them on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas, it, again, it used to be that if you were a student at the University of Virginia, you'd probably know someone who would occasionally read it because it was something to read and it was just around. So 
Anyway, something to th think about. The other thing going on this past month, I guess, and this is another one from Dr. Roy Shestowitz, is that Mega now stores 63.8 billion files and has suspended 78,000 users for copyright infringement. And he links to a story from Torrent Freak, which basically has the same title, but what they're getting this data from is a report published from sometime in the end of 2019, which was their first transparency report, which is a transparency reports, a bunch of companies, especially with websites and who offer digital services online, will make these reports saying how much censorship is happening on their systems, whether or not they've gotten a national security letter if they're in the United States or affected under US jurisdiction, DMCA requests, uh, again, in the States and Canada, with the CM DMCA and elsewhere uh, that has uh, implemented the WIPO copyright treaty and so on and so forth. So the kind of skimming through the uh, torrent free article, it shows from 2013 through 2015, files taken down, duplicate or invalid requests, uh, total requests, basically, i.e. requests to take a file that is hosted on the service mega uh, down against the wishes of, of the person who put it up due to legal reasons, like, for example, copyright, and then the proportion of files taken down versus total files. And so that proportion was at 0 0.019 or about 0 0.02, stated about 0 0.02, and has been slowly dropping from 2013 to 2015. And then let's see here, it has continued to drop. So it basically has been roughly an exponential drop off where it is now at about 0.0001% of total files taken down. And the total takedown requests has been hovering between about 51,000 and 86,000 per quarter. Now this may not sound like all that much, but still this is like hundreds of thousands of files censored per year with tens of thousands of users just removed from the service, there is probably a process and an appeals process involved, but it's still allowing groups like the RIA to choose who can share files and who can't. And so when we're talking about tens of thousands of users, I'm a user of Mega. People like, for example, Dan Bull, who is going to be one of the, the music things that I play today. Um, he was just a musician storing his own files on this service. And those were the files that were removed, that were taken down. So it just kind of gives us a scope of the problem of how much power the RIA has when they're able to pull these tens of thousands of uh, users down from a service that they're using, maybe even paying for. I didn't give any details of how many paid users versus unpaid users they're talking about. And Mega can be a paid service. I think I've even paid for Mega at one point. I, I think my, my account right now is a free account, but they do accept Bitcoin and so they, you can basically host data on the internet for Bitcoin using their service. So anyway, uh, now that I've kind of brought that up, uh, and because I have no guests today, I have two songs that I'd like to play. Uh, one of them, as mentioned, is Dan Bull. Now, Dan Bull is a little bit of a gray area. Uh, sometimes I kind of push the line a little bit because it's I don't think it's strictly speaking Creative Commons music. However, it was available on the Pirate Bay and it was released on the Pirate Bay. This is a protest album, a al album released for the pirates of the world. Arr! And so I think this one is safe to play. I think, uh, well, I guess we'll find out as I get censored. Uh, the other one is Creative Commons uh, NCBY from the 8-Bit People's Release. It is a Mesu Kasumai Highway Signs Project 65, or Project 65 remix which is kind of a little catchy uh, tune, 8-bit uh, and all. So I'm going to give these two songs a play, and we'll see you all after the break. <laughs> Mistake. You may claim it's a blatant mistake. 
mistake But it isn't, it's a major risk Face it, if you listen to Rick Astley and don't pay him How's he ever gonna maintain fame? He'll have to give it up and you'll be let down When Rick rolls out the town And obviously Morrissey needs to be paid to be played Back the DJ, back the DJ But never make a tape of the tracks he plays Home tape is killing music Like when the radio came and they tuned in Saspo actually made a good point. I don't know. I think it was slightly before the break, uh, which is, uh, and I didn't, I don't think I quite got it when I first kind of skimmed over it, which is, I'll, I'll read it again. Quote, political advertising is banned by Twitter. This leads to campaign coming up with ways to meme their candidate to expand their reach. Eat the rich uh, Bloomberg meatballs, question mark. And then it shows a link of like a picture of meatballs, which 
on its surface has nothing to do with Bloomberg. And yet that is kind of what they, the people in the know are deducing from that. So, which is kind of a good point. There's, there's a lot of picture memes or, or pictures that have a political bent, but unless you know the meaning of the, the particular symbols involved, you may not catch it. Uh, the far right apparently was kind of one of the groups, I think it was 4chan slash the far right, really advanced this art and is really uh, skilled in this, or at least there are people on the far right that are very, very skilled at making these image macro pictures, but certainly the rest of the world is catching up uh, over time. But what I find kind of interesting about this is that this used to be, this is very similar to how things used to be in China, where because of the way that the Chinese writing system works, it's, it's sometimes possible to write one thing and that if spoken aloud slightly differently, the word would have a very radically different meaning. So you'll get some stuff like, for, for example, Winnie the Pooh, uh, or what are some of the other ones? I think it was the letter G or something like that. And it, there's basically symbols and words that to a Western reader, you read this and it's just like nonsense. It's it's Or, or even to someone uh, on the, the correct PRC apparatus, uh, they may not kind of understand the symbols and how they're represented. But if you are in the know, you can know that, oh, this actually means freedom or this actually means democracy or something like that. And there, there was a tendency in the last decade or the last two decades or so uh, for people in China to kind of communicate with these kind of coded symbols and tongue in cheek references. And I think we're, we're starting to see this in the non <laughs> outside of China in on Facebook and on Twitter, where the censorship ban hammer is falling on people for being open about their political beliefs. So instead of just not talking about politics, they're still talking about politics, but they're doing so in a plausibly deniable way but in a way that is a little bit encoded, a little bit secret, a little bit uh, occult perhaps. But this is this is definitely not new, as in people for in Europe for centuries have been using kind of secret language or coded uh, dog whistles or whatever you, you want to describe them as to get their political message across. The particular manner that this is happening I, with image macros is new, but it is definitely a part of a larger trend. So anyway, speaking about censorship and ban hammers, the next article I want to read is from the Tor Project blog, published slightly before the end of the new year, i.e. December 10, quote, digital rights are human rights. And it starts with a quote from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, quote, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, Article 12. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression, Article 19. And quote, in honor of the United Nations proclamation and adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in 1948, December 10 is Human Rights Day. Unlike a linear and accumulative process, the struggle for and implementation of human rights follows an unplanned and unique path in each community. And there are often setbacks. In recent years, the international debate around human rights has started to include and analyze our relationships and interactions with technology and how we are able to or not able to exercise our human rights when we're on the internet. We believe human rights apply to all spaces we occupy offline and online. Politics and technologies have also been closely intertwined. How we conceive of our collective life has been fundamental to the ways in which we conceive our technologies, for the ways in which the early internet activist movements articulated the importance of human rights online. The quote anti-WTO protests in Seattle of nearly 20 years ago serve as a powerful example. Although different people and different movements have outlined what online utopias might look like, the internet as a liberation tool has been hijacked to become a tool of mass surveillance. Today, academics, researchers, and hackers are discussing algorithms implemented in new digital technologies and how they are being weaponized with human targets. Automated systems are implemented to capture our digital traces, monitor our daily lives with no accountability. With complete lack of transparency, digital surveillance has a real impact on human lives. Discrimination, preventing people from organizing, enabling targeting and arrest of marginalized groups, and even blocking purchases and access to services, as well as access to information. These biased, weaponized algorithms perpetuate unequal societies, marginalizing even more vulnerable groups. The right to access an open and free internet, use privacy-enhancing technologies, and especially to access to and defense of cryptography, have become critical and fundamental against a dystopic mass surveillance and censored society. The discussion can be expanded to how technologies are being built in ways that threaten human rights and how we can build another internet which advances and respects human rights. At the Tor Project, we build technologies that defend and promote the human rights to privacy and freedom. 
more than just a way to exercise an individual right. It's a collective collaboration and movement that generates a common good for all. Everyone can use this open and secure network as infrastructure that has privacy as a default feature of its design. The Tor network promotes a radical decentralization of, or with onion services, so you can run your own service without a dedicated IP address or having a domain name, all done privately and securely. Tor also promotes net neutrality since it doesn't modify the traffic based on who's accessing it or which sites they are visiting. It's what we've always wanted the internet to be. A few months ago, we told you how the community and UX teams are implementing a user feedback program, a program that combines user experience research and digital security training for human rights defenders. This program is the result of more than two years of work organizing TOR trainings with human rights defenders in the global south. We traveled to countries that where governments outlaw or punish being LGBTQ+, and block trans and gays rights websites with accusations of immorality. We know that the tools developed by TOR protect many activists in very hostile situations around the world. We listened to many stories from activists telling us that the internet wasn't always like that in their communities and that they were glad to explore freely again after installing the Tor browser. Fighting for human rights includes victories and setbacks, but our selective memory sometimes forgets one or the other. The only clear orientation is we need to stand up for our rights. If you are a human rights defender, anonymity loves company, so come use with us or come with us, use Tor and help us take back the internet. And then they have a call for donation. So the point here, though, is that one, over time, technology does change. The technology in our life, if we value freedom, democracy, anonymity, the right to publish, the right to have association in your life, the right to privacy, all these things, if you value them and in you both as an individual and as a community, use technology that is built with those goals in mind. Things can get better. And if you don't, things can get worse. The internet as we know it has gotten to the point where if you use the internet in, for example, the University of Saskatchewan and other Canadian universities and other universities around the world, there's a really good chance that your movement is being tracked, that your physical position, your computer is being monitored 24 seven. This is just very local to me. I, I live very very close to a university. And I can just imagine right now that it is possible, technically possible, uh, for someone to have a list of all of the single women students and where they're physically located at all, all points, uh, or depressed people, and kind of the intersection of those two groups. It is a abuser's dream to have that kind of real-time access to people. Yet this is what is being given. Uh, this is what marketers and advertising companies can pull, as well as things like CSIS and other parts of the Canadian government and intelligence and spying apparatus. This is something that we have built. This is the apparatus we have, the, the infrastructure we have to deal with. But it is still possible uh, once we understand that as social beings, how we are being social is to a large extent mediated by this technology that, again, can be either designed with freedom in mind or not designed with freedom in mind. And so as we continue to discuss the technology in our life, one of the things we should talk about and one of the things we should find important is, does this technology respect our freedom and respect the society we want to live in? Or do, is it actively hostile against us? Is it designed by people who are actively, either actively designing hostile features or just don't care and are doing it enough for the money that whoever uses these hostile features, who cares, right? There's plenty of that to go around as well. But the Tor project at least has the system that's up and running that, like they said, provides net neutrality, even in situations where net neutrality is not necessarily is existing. It's like a layer where things do work the way that things should be, but even if it's slower, even if it's not as real time as it could be, again, because of network or net neutrality issues. But it's worth definitely thinking about. Anyway, so this show, again, has gone a little bit longer than I normally like, as usual. You can give me a click to subscriberstar.com slash jeff-cliff if you'd like more of this sort of broadcast. And I will leave you for the week with the goodbye song, and I will see you all next week. We'll see you tomorrow, but in the meanwhile, always remember to be good and so... Bye now, I thought the party was the time.